Hey everyone, Dave Gudgel here. I sure hope that your October gets off to a great start and good things come in the month ahead. And I know one of those things is going to be chatting with Jim Wiljegren and just helping each other, encouraging each other. He is an amazing guy who continues to, in many ways, help all of us. And we thank God for that. You know, he asked me if I'd continue to pass along some information that might be helpful to you. I know one of the challenges that we all face is helping believers or young believers come to full faith in Jesus Christ. And by that, I mean making a surrendered commitment to the Lord, where they present themselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And I think that that's tested, that matter of holiness and living in the spirit, and walking in the spirit instead of in the flesh. I think that that's tested on a daily basis. And one of the ways that showed up over and over in my years of ministry experience is when I saw young couples come in and they were already living together before marriage. Oftentimes they were professing Christians, other times they were not professing Christians but I always wanted to help them do the best thing. And the best thing is experiencing God's work in their lives that can give them a kind of love that they, they want more than anything else. And one of the reasons oftentimes couples say they are living together is because they wanna just be sure and they wanna have the love that ultimately carries them out through a lifelong commitment. But many times they're walking in a direction that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where their life's headed. And, and I love to talk about Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12 with couples like that. You may be familiar with this verse that's found here. The context is that the prophet Hosea was sent by God to the nation of Israel to encourage them to turn back to the Lord. They had basically gone their own way. Uh, they were doing what was right in their own eyes. And God tells them to repent and to soften their hearts and to turn back to him and to walk in righteousness. And so Hosea brings that message and he says in Hosea 10, 12, sow for yourselves righteousness. He's writing to the nation of Israel. And of course, that would mean individuals in the nation of Israel as well. So he says, sow righteousness and reap the fruit of unfailing love, which is the fruit of righteousness the fruit of unfailing love. And that's what couples are looking for. We're all looking for love that lasts. And so I, 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 Hosea says, so break up your unplowed ground for it's time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. Now, God is longing to, uh, experience, to give us the experience of love at a level that's greater than any love we could ever produce. It's, it's a supernatural love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a love that he wants us to have first and foremost for him, where we love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But love does not fail. It continues day after day, year after year, decade after decade. He also wants us to experience that kind of love in our relationships with others. And that unfailing love Hosea said is the result of sowing righteousness. And for a couple to sow righteousness, they have to make a, a righteousness commitment, which, which is simply this. Righteousness is knowing what's right according to God, not by what the culture says, by what the world says. And it's walking in that way. So righteousness is knowing what's right, doing what's right in the eyes of God, no matter what, no matter what you think, no matter what others think, it's what God thinks. And God's desire is that couples experience unfailing love. And the way to move in that direction is to walk in his love and to be obedient to his word and to do what it is that he longs for us to do. And often when I'm working with couples, I will ask them a few questions that I found very helpful. In fact, uh, let me just run through these questions with you because you might find them helpful as you're working with those who do or do not have a relationship with God and you long to help them grow to love God and to walk with him and to love him and how they live. And so these three questions are simply this that I've asked over the years. Uh, first of all, when I get to know somebody, uh, when that opportunity comes up and perhaps it's in a counseling session or where couples have come in and say, hey, we'd like to get married. Would you perform our wedding ceremony? Well, I'll ask them somewhere typically in the first conversation, tell me about your spiritual beliefs. Do you have any 
spiritual beliefs. And that's a great way to just begin to talk about spiritual things. And sometimes they'll say, yes, we do. And other times they'll say, I don't. And, you know, but I'm interested. And sometimes they're not that interested, but they want God's blessing on their life. And so this is a great place to begin. Do you have any spiritual beliefs? And then secondly, I like to ask this question, what place would you like God to have in your relationship? Now, where you are now and where you're headed, what place? And oftentimes couples that at least talk to me about their relationship in terms of preparation for marriage or that kind of thing, they're looking for God to have some place in their relationship. And hopefully the desire would be that they, God would be at the center of their relationship. And then somewhere in that conversation, I like to then ask this question, how are your current practices congruent with your faith in God? Now, if they're living together apart from marriage, they have not uh, gone down the road of marriage, then they're living in sin. That's what we used to call it. We don't typically refer to two couples outside of marriage living together as sinning. But in God's eyes, uh, that's an unrighteous walk. That's unrighteous living. In fact, Jesus, when he came, remember he had that conversation with the woman at the well, and he uh, exposed her sin when he said, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. In other words, you may be in a living together relationship, but this person that you're with, you're not married to. So she was living in sin. She was living outside the will of God. God wants couples to wait until marriage to experience sexual intimacy, uh, but he also wants them to wait until marriage before they start living together. And so anyway, I, I think it's so important to ask this question. And often when I've asked this question, couples who have any kind of spiritual beliefs will say, well, you know, our living situation probably isn't pleasing to God. And my answer to that is not just probably, it's not. It's not his plan. And if you want to see his favor and his blessing, if you want to see unfail, unfailing love, and I'll go back to Hosea 10, 12, you know, you got to walk in righteousness. And knowing that God longs for you as a couple to experience his best, his blessing, his favor, his will, and you want to be confirmed right now and please him in all that you're doing. And if, if that's your desire, you need to walk in righteousness. So that means if you're living together outside of marriage, the best thing you can do would be to choose not to live together until you make that marriage pledge, a lifelong marriage covenant pledge before God and others to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer and poor and sickness and in health to love and the cherries till death do us part. Now, you know, I believe that when couples, when couples make a commitment to walk down the road of righteousness, God will bless that commitment. And it may seem like right now that he's blessing that commitment. Couples will often say that, but everything is so good and we're doing so well and all of that. And again, I just take them back to the fact that the, the law here is the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest is you sow in one season, you sow seed in one season, whether it's unrighteous or unrighteous seed, when you're talking about the, the, the life that God that would please God or not. But you sow in one season, you reap in another season. You don't necessarily see the result of your actions in the same season. This isn't the law of Pinocchio. The law of Pinocchio is if you lie, it's going to show up somewhere on your face, probably your nose. You remember that fictional account? Well, it's nice to talk about. And then we, you know, don't always see it that way where you uh, do something wrong and immediately pay for it. Well, in the law of the harvest, often you're not going to see the fruit of what you are doing until another season. And so I like to help a couple or an individual realize this. These are the days for sowing righteousness, for softening your heart, for opening up your heart to whatever it is that God wants to teach you and God wants to do. And that's the road toward his best, his blessing, his favor. That's the road toward unfailing love. And so I just would encourage you as you speak to others about the state of their spiritual life and their relationship with God, to explore this whole matter of love and an unfailing relationship with God, an unfailing love relationship with God, an unfailing relationship 
with a couple and the desire to give their lives to each other for life before God and to bring honor and glory to him and good to other people. And so one of the best things that you can do them is ask them, so are you sowing seeds of righteousness that ultimately reap the fruit of unfailing love? I hope that as you have the privilege of speaking to people who have or have not presented themselves to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, that when you have those opportunities, that you'll ask questions like these that will expose where they are right now in their relationship with God and encourage them to step into the best future that God has for them. And that's found in knowing and doing what is right, no matter what. Well, I hope that helps you. It's a blessing to minister with you and to you. I pray that great things continue to happen in and through your life and your ministry. All the best to you now.